Hey, Jeff. Hey, Eric. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Happy 2018 to you and all of our listeners out there. And before we get into today's podcast, we wanted to take care of a little business. Yes, we have business to attend to, which is that we are going to be at SOBs here in New York City on January 10th. We will be on stage doing what we do best, talking. We're very good at talking. We will be there talking stories. We're going to be telling jokes. We might do some songs. We definitely have some things that we want to bring up that you cannot get anywhere else. Be there at SOBs January 10th. Get your tickets right now at itsthereal.com. Again, if you guys know our track record from 2017, that's selling out SOBs, that's selling out Highline Ballroom, that's going to London and Los Angeles, you know this is a must-see event. January 10th, that's just a week and a half away, I think. Go get your tickets right now at itsthereal.com. Don't miss out. On today's episode of A Waste of Time with It's The Real, we wanted to pay tribute to our late friend, Reggio Say. You guys know him as Combat Jack, the podcaster, the co-founder of Loudspeakers Network, the lawyer, the father, the man himself. And Jeff and I were lucky enough to, along with 750 plus people, attend a memorial service this past week for Reggie at the Buddhist temple that he attended for many years. And there were a lot of great speakers that night, from his cousin Fritz to his son Chuma, to Angela Yee, to co-workers like James McMillan, to a whole bunch of people, and it painted a picture of Reggie the human being in all facets of his life. And in listening to this episode and preparing to put it out today, we got a lot of those lessons from this interview. And that's why we felt it was so important to hear it from Reggie himself. So if you weren't able to go to his service, or even if you were, there's so much to get out of this. His devotion to Buddhism, his responsibilities as a father, his love of education and the arts, his love of music, his grasping onto his own dreams and switching up a career in what people may say is late in life, and seeing those dreams through. And so we wanted to share this with you. As I'm sure a lot of you know, Jeff and I lost our father to cancer at an early age uh, eight years ago. And if there's one thing that we can impart from that experience, it's that the morals and the values and the love continue on while someone's physical self can expire here on earth. It's those things that are ingrained in you that can live on beyond that person's human life. And that's what we believe with this situation as well. If you guys knew Reggie, if you just knew him through your earphones every week, if you were a casual listener, it's what Reggie left here, those lessons that you can continue on, that you must continue on of love, of family, of unabashed intelligence, of discovery, of support, of loyalty, of forgiveness, of genuine excitement, of raising the bar that keeps combat alive. I just want to take a second to talk about our relationship with combat, who I mean, we're all doing a similar job. We have the same audience and same advertisers to appeal to. And we should be in competition, friendly or otherwise. And some people joke about podcast wars, but with Combat, it was never like that. He supported us when we were on a different network, and he supported us just the same when we later switched to loudspeakers. When we announced our last SOB show, as soon as we put out the tweet, he hit us up and asked if he could host it. And it wasn't the biggest platform for him. It's not like he was thirsty. It's that he honestly supported and supported honestly. We were supportive of one another. We, we sent potential guests his way, and he was appreciative. We were all chasing this one interview, and someone else got it, and he wrote to us to say, at least we know it won't be as good as your or ours. Stay doing what you do. Ignore those guys, but you already know that. We saw combat after our Rockefeller show, and there were a lot of people who said nice things, but no one's words meant more that night than combat's. And I was eagerly looking forward to him doing something that would scare us into greatness. I think what I'll miss most about Combat is his support of us, of his friends, of his family. I'll miss the way he said culture, how he meant it, the way he laughed with every ha as its own word. 
the way he screamed swag at the Lil B show and talked about how he had seen the future. How when we saw him at his place right before he started chemo, he talked like he would beat cancer. How he was excited to get back in the gym. How he said he hadn't been this skinny since he was 30. How he wasn't afraid. And that's something they talked about at the memorial service, that there was no fear in death because of his belief in Buddhism. Before Reggie started chemo, we had a chance to see him and we had a chance to tell him how much we cared for him, how much we appreciated everything he did, and how much we loved him. And in listening back to this episode, I am so grateful that we actually recorded our same sentiments a couple years before and that can live on forever. And I'm glad that when we met with Reggie, that we had put out a tweet that said, you know, let us know your favorite combat episodes. Let us know what combat means to you. Let's keep this fight going. And I'm glad that we were able to communicate that for you guys, that we were able to say what you wanted to say to him for you guys. So let's continue the celebration of Reggie Osei, a.k.a. Combat Jack. Long live Reggie. Jeff, when do you want to get into it? Right now. Yo, what up? It's Eric, a.k.a. Moving Bass, a.k.a. Jazz. Yo, what up? It's Jeff, a.k.a. Jumpman, Jumpman, a.k.a. Auto Mechanic. Internet! <laughs> it's your boy, Combat Jack. What's up, guys? Yeah, this is a waste of time with It's The Real. Yo, Combat Jack. Yo, what's up? Yo, you're really here in the building. I'm in here in the flesh. You guys prepared <laughs> such an amazing meal. Thank you. Thank you. Full. We made you some pasta, Thank you. you know, bolognese sauce with a little, uh, you know, onion and celery and carrot and parsley and whatever else. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and asparagus on the side. And then I bought you some cookies. Yo, yes. Listen, made not by. Just, not just some cookies. Made These by are, your wife. You, made by your unbelievable wife. Kim. Yo. The bakery on Bergen. Let me get I was my ju- plug. I was yeah. just going to say, give me the address. Uh, 740 Bergen Street, right off of Washington Avenue. What's Brooklyn, that train stop? Brooklyn, New York. That's, uh, cl- uh, I want to say it's Clinton, Washington. Okay. Okay, yeah. off the sea. Off the sea. Yo. There you go. <laughs> you fucking guys are grilling me. So how do you guys like the cookies, man? Yo, they're Amazing. so good. Good, 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 they're good. So, good. So, so everybody's happy. Yes. Listen, we're, yeah, so far, so good. So far, so good. Yeah, you have been twice now the only person to bring us food on our podcast. Really? Which yeah. we appreciate. These ungrateful <laughs> bastards. Yeah. Who raised Would these you, guys? Wouldn't you be surprised if the Migos didn't bring us anything? The Migos didn't bring you anything? <laughs> no, they just brought us headaches. <laughs> headaches, okay. Um, it's listen. good to be back here, man. It's, it's really, really good to be back here. You are. And, and, I, and I really, I think I sent you guys a note. A couple of months ago, I really appreciate you guys. I really oh. appreciate what you guys do. Thank you, and, and and I mean that from the heart, man. Well, the same the same goes from us to you. you. Uh, you are someone who every time we see you, it's all love. Yes, um, you're just a genuine soul, a good person, yeah. and in this business, we really appreciate. Not that. unless you want to start some beef. Yo, I don't know. <laughs> let's get let's get it popping. Yo, let's get into it like a <laughs> minute forty, so people listen to yeah, the whole. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. You have. Really, like, an amazing history. And I think what's cool is, look, we're, we're two guys who, over the course of eight years, our career, we've done a whole bunch of different things, yes, right? Have. And we made that move, um, honestly, just without regard for what people would think or... Which is how you should do or it. Or what your legacy would right. be. What's same, always same here. That's, that's what I was going to get right. to. Like, it's always impressed me that you were... Look, you're a lawyer. You, you have a family. You had a career that was... Not just like one year, two years, and you switched it up. This yep. was like your job. Yep. This was your career. And then you were like, you know what? I'm not happy in this. I'm going to switch it up. But we'll, we'll get there. Okay. We'll get to that. But um, can we start from the beginning? Let's start from the beginning. You're born and bred in Brooklyn. Born and raised, born and bred in Brooklyn. First generation American. What well, hospital? Via, um, shit. Oh, my God. Um, you just caught me. <laughs> uh, Brookdale Hospital. <laughs> Off the C train. I (laughs) believe Brookdale Hospital is the birthplace of Mike Tyson and Michael Jordan. No kidding. Brookdale, yes. I think that's a biggie lyric. I know, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I think the late, great uh, Sean Price was also born in Brookdale. No kidding. Yeah. And how many siblings do you have? I am an only child. You were enough. (laughs) I was enough. Well, um, so um, my mom had me, and then my mom and my dad were never married. Mm -hmm. So I've got a lot of... uh, the half siblings, mm-hmm. but I grew up the only child, which is actually kind of fun. Man. We don't know what that's like. It was all yeah, mine. No. Yeah, I didn't have to share. Um, so now having four kids is, is, is it's it's really a, a it's really it's really bugged out. Like how uns- how how I have to program myself to be as selfish as I am. When you decided to have kids, were you like one may be enough, or were you like I want to have a brood? I wanted two. Yeah, and then we had three. And then we had four. <laughs> but but my wife is so bad. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, uh, growing up, did you ever want siblings? Uh, there were a couple of times when I wanted siblings, but other than that, I was just so used to, you know, um, being into my own head, man, being into my own space, um, being free to, to be a nerd and, and, and grow up with hip hop and just, just the freedom. Like, of, of I was kind of like a latchkey kid because my mom worked, you know, 24 seven. So, yeah. you know, other than the basics of like doing your schoolwork and being respectful, like I had free reign of like the home and the streets. But I knew, like, I, I knew at a young age what my boundaries were. Okay. And my boundaries were to never disappoint your mom. My mom. That's pretty yeah. good. How were you at like jumping on the train and just going wherever you wanted? So, yeah, I mean, but you, you got to think this is like late seventies, mm-hmm. right? Eighty, so mm-hmm. we were really jumping on the train, yeah. You know, riding the outside of the. Did train. you really? Yeah, and we would we would do stupid shit because we didn't have video games and, yeah. and stuff like. I mean, we, we, New York was pretty lawless, so I remember me and my friends would travel to the Bronx just so that we could cross the elevated. Subway, like just the L, <laughs> just across, like outside, like we would cross that shit Man. a couple of times, and you know, cop, you know, we we didn't have a militarized uh, police state at the time, so we just ran rampant. You had, you did had, you watch the uh, documentary Rebel Kings? Yes, on, I did. Uh, on Netflix, amazing, and amazing, it, and and I love documentaries like that because it really takes me back to my childhood in New York City. That's how yeah. it fucking was. By the way. Uh, Executive produced by Jim Carrey. Okay. Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? Apparently. Yeah. It's wow. about... I, I don't know if people know what it is. It's like about uh, gangs in uh, 1970s New York. New York. There were a lot of gangs. It was yeah. really like the Warriors. If, yeah. If, if you guys don't know about the Warriors, yeah. you had gangs in, in every neighborhood. It wasn't just like Bloods and Crips. And, 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 and no, it was like a block by block, block basis. Block by block basis. Yeah. It was very territorial and you could find yourself fucked up yeah. on the wrong block. Did you ever get in any trouble in the Bronx? No. Never. Like I was in and out. Um, you know, my my friends and I were just nimble. We 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 were very lucky. Yeah, we were very lucky. Not well, to riding on the outside well, of trains first. But of all. also, I mean, like they're talking about in the documentary, and I mean, uh, maybe you can speak to this, um, even though you were in Brooklyn. But like how the cops couldn't even get into um, into the Bronx because like when people would shoot. Uh, and and leave bodies in the streets like the bodies would be left there because people would then shoot the cops who went to go uh, retrieve the bodies. Mm. You know, I don't know and the ambulances. I don't know much about that, but I do know the difference in policing is up until the late 80s cops were very reactive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They waited for something to happen. And then there weren't a lot of cops on payroll anyway. New York was virtually bankrupt. And it wasn't until a cop got assassinated by the Supreme Team mm. in, in, in Queens mm-hmm. in, in, uh, in the late 80s. That's what, that's, that's what set off cops being so proactive. Yeah. Right? And, and zero tolerance and broken windows policy and the whole nine. Um, I'm, I'm not a, a New York historian, by the way. <laughs> so. so did you grow up and go through like elementary, middle, and high school with the same crowd? No. I uh, So my uh, first through third grade, my school closed at the third grade. Really? Got sent to a different school from the fourth to the sixth grade and then i got pulled out i went to catholic school okay. all, all my life a catholic uh, uh, uh same with us yeah get, get out of here you guys went to catholic school no fuck out of here so i got sent to this really special school called uh, robert f robert f kennedy incentive program in in, in the ridgewood section of brooklyn it's kind of like the border of brooklyn and queens mm-hmm. and they took i guess the brightest kids from like local catholic schools and it was like this kind of like makeshift private school and what was awesome about it is like there was one sixth grade one seventh grade one eighth grade the year i got there was the first year that they integrated girls into the program Hmm. but the the greatest thing is like we had a school trip every year in which we would travel to europe wow Um, so in the seventh grade we went to Spain, no, to to Italy. Really, and that shit was it was just you know being a, a city kid and then being exposed to Italy with your peers. Oh my yeah. god, you know, from, yeah. And I just remember like my my mom didn't come a lot of it was optional for parents to come, but I, I would imagine that it was pretty costly. And I to this day I I keep asking my peers. Which one of us in the seventh grade snuck weed all the way to Italy? Because I remember just bawling in somebody's room, smoking some dirt weed, man, all the way from Brooklyn, you know, to Italiano style. So it was yeah. Sean Price. And then in the eighth grade, we traveled to uh, 
to Spain. And I think the, the amazing thing about traveling is when you really start seeing the differences in culture. Yeah. So um, when I went to Italy, I just remember one time watching the television and there was a commercial and this woman just went topless. And I was like, oh, shit, but it was nothing. <laughs> right. And that's when I realized that America might kind of be backwards in yeah. terms of like sexuality. And this is a se- in, the se- in the seventh grade. In the eighth grade, when we went to Spain, we went, our teachers took us to a wine tasting tour. Mm-hmm. And we got fucked <laughs> up. Like we drank wine all day in the eighth grade. Man. And knowing that you can't do this, I was like, what's wrong with the States? The yeah. States is really backwards. So, you know, it's very important to travel. You guys know. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's sure. really important to travel, particularly um, as kids, as, as children. Yeah. yeah. Um, our eighth grade trip was to Washington. Washington, <laughs> D.C.? Yeah. Yeah, we didn't we didn't hit you know yeah, we didn't get fucked up off wine or no. you know <laughs> <laughs> didn't didn't smoke that chiba no <laughs> eighth grade you coming back from Italy and Spain you come back with all this sort of worldly you know viewpoint at this at this point what's high school like for you um, high school I went to Xavier High School okay uh, in uh, Chelsea. Uh, all Go male, Tigers. All male, uh, <laughs> Jesuit, quasi military. Really? And I made that choice, man. I had the option of going to different schools, but I was like, you know what? I like Xavier. It, it was, it was a good, like, you know, prep school in terms of like the Catholic school system. Mm-hmm. And I kind of felt at the time that I wanted that discipline. I didn't want to be distracted by girls because I knew I could easily be yeah. distracted by girls. So sure. I really went for the discipline and, and and I really enjoyed it, man. Okay. Were there dances that you would go to? We had we had sister schools. Okay. And um and because those Catholic girls yeah, they're wild. They're, they wild. Wild. they're wild. Yeah. They're yeah. wild. They're wild. Because um, they don't know any better. They don't know what's they on don't the outside. Know any better. <laughs> I remember making out in, in the lobby with this chick because I wanted to impress my boys. Yeah, yeah, and, you yeah. know, just mm-hmm. dumb shit like that, yeah. man. But Xavier was cool. I mean, I think it, you know, I, I think. Wait, I've were always, they impressed? Huh? Were your friends impressed? Uh, she was kind of <laughs> ugly, so I don't think they were. But, yeah. you know, you, 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 the dumb shit you do when you're young. Right. But I've, I, I've always been. Um, just pretty focused on on education. Mm-hmm. Just really, just that. That's if anything. That's what my mom drilled down, and I, I've always, I always wanted to learn, man. I never wanted to be the dumb kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what did what did religion mean to you at that point? Okay, so I come from the most Catholic family on the planet, mm-hmm. in which out of my five uncles, four of them were Catholic priests. Wow, and my two existing aunts are nuns. Wow. So I come from the most Catholic family so in high school you know it started to dawn on me that growing up in such a religious household the it it didn't mean anything to me Mm -hmm. you know i was kind of i felt actually between high school and law school i kind of felt spiritually lost Hmm. and i was actually searching for religion like really hungering for um spirituality in my life and i you know i had looked into the nation of islam Mm -hmm. um because you know back in the late 80s you know farrakhan public enemy that was that was that was some spirituality for your ass yeah yeah, yeah. and the shit was dope you know by the way eric is nodding like he also (laughs) yeah yeah, eric's like yeah yeah yeah, yeah, that's right i wanted to be an m1 yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) but you know um in my last year of law school um i encountered buddhism Hmm. and that really it, it, it fit like a glove, and I've been a practicing Buddhist now for what twenty six years. Really? Yeah, and it, it's you know just really changed my life. I, you know, and I didn't know that, but yeah. that makes so much sense in thinking about like your demeanor, the whole thing. But back to high school for a second. Yeah. Like so, Catholic school they drill that into you, right? I mean, that's part of your curriculum. Your like the or whole God and yeah, sure, sin and Jesus yeah, 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 died yeah. for our sins and the, yeah, I guess so. But you know, like in in. My, I think in, in, in our school, as in most Catholic schools, at least from my experience, it's like those were the gut classes. Mm-hmm. Those were the classes you went and you kind of bullshitted your way mm-hmm. through. Mm-hmm. And it was, a re, you know, requisite courses yeah. because of these are Catholic schools. But they weren't – it wasn't like, – I mean, you know, I think what was really drilled down was discipline. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, particularly in an in a, in a all-male mm-hmm. school, particularly with, you know – I didn't know at the time, but we had some weirdo priests. You know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it was really just that whole disciplinarian thing, which I was actually seeking out. Hmm. And and you're a better person because of the discipline. Um, I think I'm a better person because of that focus on education. And when when it came time to send your kids to school, were you like, 
they'll make the choice as to whether they want no. discipline or so, not? No. So my wife, unbelievable, Kim. Yeah. Um, Follow her. Yep. She is uh, an amazing private tutor. Mm-hmm. And she is actually one of the top, she's one of the most sought after private tutors in New York City. Well, because she's making cookies for everybody. <laughs> she, she makes cookies for everyone, but that, you know, really, she 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 actually grew up in the private school system. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's really good at navigating students through that system, which I didn't know, you know, yeah. existed. Um, to the point where some of these schools actually refer her to their students, and wow. she, you know, she she has some pretty um, impressive clients. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you guys off air. Yeah, sure. Or clients. Um, so, uh, by Justine the, Sky. Yeah, no, I was, I was <laughs> going to say, I was going to yeah, say, yeah. A, a she, friend, she home, friend she, of the podcast. She homeschooled Justine Sky. She also homeschooled this other band by the name of S- the Skins. Okay, they're signed to Rick Rubin's label oh, wow. and were managed by. Uh, what's the Garnier guy from um, from, from oh, Entourage? Adrian Garnier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Like no, the, sure. The shampoo. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fructo, fructose. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That Memphis Bleak. Uh, yeah, but yeah. so, so, yeah. so, you know, her thing was, you know, we got to get our kids into private school. And I was like, honey, we can't afford this. But she knows how to navigate her way through. That's awesome. Schools, yeah, yeah she's I mean, unbelievable. She's, yeah, she's unbelievable. unbelievable. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we just don't know that, like, that private school life, dude. Like, you know? It's 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 so privileged. Yeah, it's like really privileged. Like, right. Um, What's my, the admission process like? Uh, you, you'd have to ask. Unbelievable, kid. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I just know on the first day that my kid, my sons walked in, they all got iPads. Wow. And we're talking about four four years ago before I think that started becoming common practice sure, in school. Sure. Um, and you know, la- uh, you know, last year our kids, our, our two eldest sons, flew to China with the school, and you know, so they're you know they've traveled. Yeah, and it's just an uh, and you know, well, just like their father. Yeah, just like their father. But it's amazing because the tuition overall is forty thousand a year per student, Holy which is Jesus. crazy. That is crazy. Crazy. So it's 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 frightening to me now. You know, when you hear about this um, economic divide, this wealth gap. Yep. Um, the um, eroding erosion of the the middle class and then you see where you know my kids go to school with these one percenters yeah mm-hmm. i mean yeah one percenters and it's it's just really frightening how prepared these kids are for the future and how unprepared most of these other kids i, I don't want to make an assumption but a lot of kids are unprepared for the future yeah right? yeah most definitely so uh getting to the end of high school yeah where are you looking to go to school um so this is a great story actually so um it was mid 80s and I had an amazing art teacher by the name of uh, Marilyn Minter. Mm-hmm. And Marilyn Minter was kind of like this punk, kind of like drugged out chick from like the downtown scene. But she really, um, she really touched me with regard to um, artistry. And I, you know, got me open into like painting and drawing. And I knew at the time that I was going to be an artist, mm-hmm. a, a visual artist. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, um, that was my favorite class. Um, and at the time I didn't know, like she was actually running with Basquiat and Warhol and that downtown crew. Man. Um, can I skip forward please? to to how cool she was? Yeah. So, you know, she really, uh, inspired me to become an artist. I, you know, I got into Cornell. She's like, the school sucks, but follow. <laughs> but you got into Cornell. The, the, the fine arts program sucked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you're into Corn- you're in Cornell right now. You, so you, you know. can get to that school of agriculture like real easy. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, when I got to Cornell, I just realized how, how poor, how, how, how the art, the fine arts program really sucked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I just did a, a, a 180 and I decided to go pre law. Yeah. So I had a conversation with her at the time and she was like, you're giving up art? Like, you, you're a pussy. Like, you, you know, she went off on me. Hadn't seen her in years. And a couple of summers ago, I'm watching the debut of uh, Jay-Z's Picasso Baby. Yeah. And she's in there. Crazy. Oh, whoa. With Jay-Z, with credits. That's awesome. With credits. So I, I recently hooked up with her. And she's this thriving artist now in her 70s. Um, she, you know, recently did um, skateboard decks for um, Supreme. Wow. <laughs> um, and she's got this... this ill uh retrospective going on right now about the bush um and just bringing back 
women being very comfortable with their pubic hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, with their pubic hair. And she's just a brilliant. And so we, you know, now, now that I kind of live this creative life, yeah. Um, she's really proud of me. But, and, you know, I keep telling her, like, I'm so fucking proud. I never had a teacher that I was so fucking proud of. Yo, I mean, obviously you know this, but that's not, that's so not the average art teacher. No, no, no. And, and so, What's crazy, like to, to to wind this story up, is when I met her for the first time since high school, two summers ago. I was like, Marilyn Minter, you were <laughs> such, you know, an inspiration to me. And she's like, Reggie, half the time I was coming to class, I swear to God, I was high off crack. <laughs> oh my God! I mean, but you yeah, know, but yeah, cause yeah, because she kind of, <clears throat> she kind of had to get Blaze to to come into this like tight. Jesuit, yeah, and at the time I didn't know the shit was perverted, but she kind of knew. Sure, and some I don't want to shit on Xavier, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, you know the, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and also that's like a day job, and she's hanging out with like you know yep. the coolest artists, the coolest around. artists of, of the time. Um, Fab Five Freddy really and... excuse crack. No, no, no yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel right, like we're right, all making right. a lot well, of excuses you know what? for crack. I think everyone kind of smoked crack in the. Mid yeah, but it's always been whack, right? Crack is whack. Yeah. Crack is yeah. Whack. Um, <laughs> two things. Yeah. One is um, uh, we were on your show. I want to say, well, we've been on your show a few times yeah, actually. Yeah. But the the when we when we uh, put out our mixtape Urban Outfitters Volume One um, with DJ Drama, we came on and we played you a couple tracks. One of which was our song with Bun B called "Girls, Girls with, with the Dirty, Dirty Souths." South. And we salute those women who let the bush grow. Yes, yes, so yes. we're on the same wavelength. Yeah, you got you got to yes. see our artwork. It's no, really, I'm sure it's really dope. With it. it's That's really awesome. Dope. Yeah. Um, second thing is, Jeff was class artist his senior year of high school. Sure was. Your art teachers, with all due respect, were were definitely not on the same level, right? No, but she was definitely on crack. Okay, so. yeah, 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 yeah. she was on crack. She wasn't, <laughs> she wasn't hanging out with Bascot. <laughs> no, she. Okay. I mean, you know, it's a little further. We, she was coming in from Westchester. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Did you uh, Did you win any uh, awards in high school? No. Like, I mean, or, like in the yearbook? No, I just said? I just kept it real low. Um, I remember my uh, theater, uh, the guy that ran theater was trying to get me to join theater. And I was like, I'm not fucking... Because I just really loved my freedom. Yeah, like, yeah, I wasn't yeah. part of any athletics. I'd go to school. I'd do my schoolwork. And then I'd go home. Yeah. Um, and hang out with my friends in my, on my block. And I remember in my senior year, uh, Father Sullivan pressured my mother to pressure me to join drama. Really? And I was like, fuck you. <laughs> this is fucked up. I don't want to do this shit. And I had the best time. Oh. I just really had the best time. So he saw something in you? He or? saw something yeah. in me. And, and I think, you know, I was always destined to do something creative, something vocal, something expressive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I made that shift to, to become a lawyer, yeah. it just all got stifled. Well, so what brings you to Cornell, to upstate? Like, are you looking for an Ivy League school? I got you... into I got into Cornell. I just, Did you look in any other places? Um, I, I, you know, it's really fucked up, man. I had a um, my guidance counselor, um, Father McGowan. Mm-hmm. I, I realized later on in life that I, I I think he was racist. Really? Because or just biased or whatever the fuck you want to call it. Because I remember at the time, um, wanting my my first choice because just of my my friends talking about it. I really wanted to go to Syracuse, and he was like, Syracuse is beyond your reach, but you should really aim for Howard. Now I have nothing against Howard, but I was like, okay, and I really believed him. Mm-hmm. And then when I, when I got accepted to Cornell, I didn't realize it until a year later. He was really pissed off. Really? He was not encouraging at all. He was really pissed off. And it wasn't until when I was at Cornell, some other kids came up to visit. And they were like, yeah, Father McGowan was talking about how some bozo got into Cornell. That's so if he, had a, if he had a shot, then they had a shot. As someone, as I'm a Syracuse graduate. Yeah. Cornell is far beyond. Syracuse had the girls. No, it, it did. And it the did. parties. And yeah. was it Sky Barn? Uh, Sky Barn, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, like yeah. Carrier Dome, like all yes, of that. Yes, like yes. it was just, it was a great time. We had one quad. You guys had like eight, yes, right? Yes. Huge campus. Huge campus. Um, Ithaca Go is, Big Red. Ithaca is gorge- gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, honestly, for an education, like it's Ivy League. I mean, it's yeah. it's world renowned. Yeah. Far beyond. So, fuck father, whatever his name is. McGowan. McGowan. That's horrible. Yeah. Um, and I, I hope... Father McGowan is a listener of this podcast. Well, and I father wish that you guys McGowan wouldn't... actually passed on. Oh, did he really? Um, and and <laughs> I remember some students, like some, some, some alum were like, 
we ran into some alum like, yo, did you hear that Father McGowan passed away? And I was kind of dry. I was like, yo, fuck him. And yeah. they all looked at me like I was like a, you know, blasphemy. But it was like, fuck him. Like, fuck him. Yeah, 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 yeah. For, for trying to do that to my dream. No, that's right, fucked yeah. up. Wait, question. So p- the Pope comes to town. Yeah. Recently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you grew up Catholic. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Pope coming to town? Did you care at all? I didn't care at all. Our mom cared so much. <laughs> really? Yeah. My our, mom cared so much. Our mom. Yeah, but my family your, cared so much. But our yes, but they like, are Catholic. Our yeah. mom. Our mom's a Jewish woman who was just. But he's like, a rock. He's like a religious rock star. He is. He's yeah. a religious rock. Time star. Warner had that like twenty four hour channel, and she was yep. just glued to it. Yep. Yeah. Like I mean, my, our mom was watching the Pope on mute. <laughs> for, for 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 what it's worth, this guy is very progressive. Sure, sure. From what I understand. Yeah. yeah. And and is and is actually softening. I guess some of the views that the Catholic Church has had on on a, on a lot of issues. So, Listen, our yeah. mom just like seeing him in the Pope Mobile like going Pope through Mobile, Central Park. You know, looking like, did you see the the one image where he looked like he was about to drop the illest mixtape? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> the shot with Obama. Yeah, 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 too? yeah, 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 yeah. Back to back. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, so you go up to school at Cornell. Yeah. What are you expecting to do up there? Um, I'm expecting to learn. Okay. And so. I guess the disconnect was my my first semester in fine arts. I was not learning anything. What kind of roommate did you have? Um, uh, I had a really nerdy roommate, and we got into an altercation, and we had to draw straws as to who was going to move out, and he had to move out. So my freshman year, I guess three, four months into my freshman year, I had a double. That's dope. Which was dope. <laughs> Oh, did good you, choice against you, the altercation. <laughs> yeah, did you rig that uh, that straw process? No, I didn't. I was like, I, yo, <laughs> I, straw pole. I, I, I Does just, that mean he had to move in with two other dudes and like they had a triple? I don't know. And what I, I don't been give a, a fuck where he had to move, but I had a double and it was. Popping. What was the altercation over? Um, so he was, uh, I guess, from the Midwest. I'm a city kid. Yeah, yeah. I like to hang out. He was tight, and then he had some kind of like medical issues also. So he mm. was just like. Just annoyed all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I had a girlfriend. And yeah. it was just like, yo, like, we, <laughs> we're not getting along at all. Yeah. So we brought it to the R. I mean, it wasn't like any type of fist fight. Right, yeah, right. Physical, but. Because he didn't want it. <laughs> well, he also couldn't handle it. He had a medical issue. He had yeah, a medical yeah, issue. Yeah. So I didn't want to, like, sock him and his neck no. <laughs> twist to the side of some shit. So we. <laughs> so <laughs> we. <laughs> 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 so we spoke to our RA man, and they resolved it that way, man. Uh, um, and you know, I, I got the the I got the, the room. Yeah, and but going back to your question, yes, I felt that like I I saw my peers that were like in engineering and agriculture mm-hmm. and medicine and and pre law. I saw their minds being challenged, and I'm sitting in these classes with. Um, these trust fund kids, yeah, like smelling like fucking glue and um, <laughs> and clay and paint, and I was like, you know what, I I felt that I had to soak up. Like I, I swear, at that young age, I was like, I have to come here and soak up some education. Did your parents have any expectations on what you should do with your career? First generation American, first to go to college. My parents were like, you go to college. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Like yeah. th- that's it. Yeah, like, yeah. We, we don't know. You know, so I was pretty aimless. I didn't have any aim. I didn't have any guidance. Yeah. Um, yeah, fuck Father McGowan. Fuck Father McGowan. And then I happened to uh, come home one day during break, and I saw one of my cousins who was a Park Avenue attorney at the time. I saw his pay stub, and I was like, fuck it. I'm going to law school. Whoa. Did you? But did you have the idea, too, that you were going to, like, law school means another three years? Yes. And you were, like, totally for it? I was like, F- I want that check. Yeah. I want that And whatever check. it takes to get mm-hmm. there, I'm going to do it. Yeah. You decide that, like... Freshman year? Freshman year. Wow. After my first semester. Wow. And I decided to transfer and it was painful. It was so fucking painful. Just yeah. just just getting acclimated to the, 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 the coursework and you know, I'm now in I totally skipped like the one on ones. I'm in statistics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One what one oh two and, and econ and all of this shit. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. Yeah. I'm not ready for this shit. So I actually almost failed out. Well you're going from left brain all the way to right exactly. brain. Exactly. Yeah. And it was like but I persevered. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 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 I had some good friends who had some some great um study habits. And mm-hmm. I just really adapted to what they were doing so that by junior year I had a hang of it. And then by senior year I was soaring. That's dope. Yeah. Um how are you getting up and back to to Ithaca? 
we you know we'd rent the car okay and, you know just you know we'd all yeah all chip in and rent the car and, yeah, 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 and drive yeah. back and forth and, yeah um, but Ithaca's beautiful man and, and it coming is. from New York I mean you're, we're we're in New York State yeah right um we're four hours away yeah but New York is still accessible it's still New York so yeah. and at the time. Cornell had a really strong inner city recruitment program. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of kids from Brooklyn, a lot of kids from Harlem, a lot of kids. So we had our community yeah. that I was able to identify with sure. and not get swallowed up into ge- the general greater mm-hmm. uh, Cornell population. Did you ever make any trips out of the colleges like while at school? Were you we guys road tripping? We used to go to Syracuse. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Syracuse um, had the babes, man. Syracuse <laughs> had the women and the parties. Um, but, you know, Binghamton, Buffalo, you sure. the whole, yeah, yeah, that yeah. whole up there. Yeah. Sounds so glamorous. <laughs> it wasn't, but it was fun, man. You know, you know, upstate yeah, in, no. the, in the winters are just harsh. Yeah. But, you know, I, I just love being away from New York at the time. And that's when, when I was in college, was really when the crack epidemic was starting to hit. Yeah. So mm-hmm. every time I would come back to Brooklyn, shit would shift. Like, I was like, I why are my friends on the corner right now? Yeah. Like, why are my friends that I grew up with that we played with G.I. Joes and, yeah. and Matchboxes, why, on it, why are they on the corner? And, whoa, why are they carrying guns? Yeah. And I'd go back to school and come back and I'm like, wait, who are those 20 other motherfuckers that are on the corner? So I grew up on, on, in, in, Crown, in the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn uh, on Lincoln Place, Lincoln Place between Albany and the legendary Troy Avenue. Yep. Like, mm-hmm. I grew up on Troy Avenue. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I understand what Troy Ave is trying to emulate by because that was like a main vein of the of the crack trade back back in the day in yeah, yeah yeah um so you come back and everything's changed a lot and a lot how do you associate with the same guys you grew up with um loose like you know some kids were not every kid was a you know a, a hustler right but you know the ones that were destined to be hustlers were hustlers, and I stayed cool with the. I stayed cool with everybody, but I I didn't stay on the block because now, you know, I'm in college. I'm coming back, and I'm starting to discover the New York nightlife, the New York club scene, which is all in Manhattan. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, all in Manhattan, the Paradise Garage, yep. and just you know Bentleys and all these other legendary clubs that that existed in New York at the time. So I barely stayed in Brooklyn. Yeah, you know, I did all my hanging out in the city. Is um, it weird to see like the shift, like? that Brooklyn is going through now where it's just like, I mean, I'm sure it is. I, I already know the answer to this question. <laughs> I guess talk about um, what it was like, um, you know, to see Brooklyn. Um, so my wife is really happy about all this, you know, aggressive gentrification going on. Cause she's like, we miss growing up. My wife's also a, a native Brooklyn. She's yeah. like, we mm-hmm. miss being able to hang out in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas our kids, my my eldest son is 18 i have a, my other son is 17 and mm-hmm. my my youngest son is 13 they never had a fight mm. in their lives i don't know if that's rare to you but to me it's like they never had a fight right and there's nothing wrong with that yeah there's nothing wrong with that and they hang out with their friends and they they have a cool um crew and there's like all these cool spots right now and it's, yeah. it's safe and i actually feel a lot safer with my kids Going out, hanging out in, in, in New York, in Manhattan or, or Brooklyn or whatever. I feel safe yeah. mm-hmm. for the most part where, you know, back then it was not safe. Yeah. So, <coughs> pardon me, I, I, I do um, embrace that aspect of, of the change in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, but then with that, I'm, I'm really worried about, you know, my kids now. To me, they're still babies, but mm-hmm. they don't look like babies there. My 13-year-old is, what, six one. Mm. And he looks like a black man. And it's mm-hmm. like, to me, he's a baby. And it breaks my heart that at any given moment, a cop might stop him and ask him to identify himself. Yeah. Which has happened, actually. Really? Yeah. So wh- he goes to private school. And, you know, the days that public schools are in, in, you know, in session and private schools are in and they see him walking around. And right. They don't assume that he goes to private school. So what, is that, what, is, what was that conversation like with him? That, that conversation had... We had we 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 we've been having that conversation with yeah. our kids since like they're fighting over like some stupid toy at three or four and like this is not fair like life's not fair and you and and so we drilled that into our kids at an early age yeah um, we're really progressive about not shying away from that issue yeah mm-hmm. so you coming back to a city that's changed um, you're on your way through college you you know you're going to law school no I'm going to law school 
where are you looking at law school? Um, so I got the notion, and this is a great story. Yeah. This is a fucking great story. <laughs> um, so at the time, I read somewhere that the top school law school was Georgetown. Okay. So I was like, fuck it. <laughs> I'm, going, like, to Ge- I'm going to Georgetown. Right. You wanted sports. <laughs> I wanted the number one spot. Yeah. yeah. For what, I, I was just aggressive like that. Yeah. And, yeah. and just um, aggressive. And once again, not, you know, no guidance, but just really moving on, you know, what I'm hearing and impression. And like, if I'm going to law school, I might as well go to the number And at the time, the Hoyas were. Yeah, mm, sure. Fucking amazing. Yeah, yeah. You know, so um, so I applied to Georgetown. I applied to some other safe schools also. I got into all the other safe schools. I didn't get into Brooklyn Law. Really? I didn't get into Brooklyn Law. But I got waitlisted for um, Georgetown. And I didn't know what that meant. I thought that was like, you're in, but you're not in, but you're in. Yeah. Yeah. So my uncivilized ass, <laughs> I just started picking up the phone and harassing the dean of students. Like, dude, I got to get in. Yeah. Dude, I got to get in. So I'm doing this all throughout my last semester of law school. I don't, fuck it, I'll tell the story. So, <laughs> so I'm riding through the summer and I, I'm, I'm like, you know what? If I don't get into Georgetown, I'm gonna put all I'm gonna I'm gonna put all these other schools on pause. I'm gonna work the year and just take the the, the LSATs again and reapply. So it's fucking the first week in August. I'm at, I'm at, I'm at this nightclub called the Paradise Garage, mm-hmm. which was a nightclub that opened its doors at midnight and closed its doors at noon. So it was like just it, this is New York in the eighties. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so they didn't have a liquor license, but it was a open air club with regard to whatever else you could bring in there. Yeah. So I am specifically tripping off of mescaline. <laughs> like I'm tripping, I'm fucking seeing lights and I'm tripping. And yeah. it's just like, and it's, so I run into my high school friend, father McGowan. No, not, not <laughs> fuck father McGowan. Run into my high school friend, Sam Galloway. And Sam is with his girlfriend from Connecticut. And he's like, yo, Reg, he's in the garage. His girlfriend is in the garage. It's like four in the morning. I'm tripping. I'm yeah. tripping. <laughs> he's like, yo, what are you doing next year? And I was like, I, and he had, he decided he was going to be a state trooper. Okay. Um, and I was like, dude, I'm trying to get into law school. I'm trying to get into Georgetown. These motherfuckers don't want me to live. I can't <laughs> not let me live. I'm on this wait. I'm trying to. So his girl says, wait a minute. My aunt dates the dean of students and then i fucking sobered up and i was like get the fuck out of here so this is friday night saturday morning sunday night i'm on the phone with her aunt monday i'm on the phone with the dean of students are you on mescaline still friday i drive (laughs) down to georgetown we have an interview he shakes my hand that following monday western union i'm in georgetown yo two weeks before classes start now that's awesome. Now, what's really awesome is this dean took a big risk with me. And okay. then he hadn't heard of me since I graduated from high school. I'm jumping around now. Last June, I got tapped to give the keynote speech at the Howard Law School yes. right. uh, commencement ceremony. And as I'm walking in, I bump into my dean. And he's like... Hey, what are you? And I'm in like full regalia and the whole night. He's like, "What are you doing here?" And I'm like, "Oh my god!" So I get up on stage to give this speech, and I was like, "Not only do I have to inspire the students, but I really want to show this guy yeah. that he really made the right choice. Like, I, he didn't fuck up that, yeah. that one gamble." Yeah. Um, and then we just connected after that. He was like, "Dude, you blew me away. This was amazing. That's incredible." And so now, one of I think his son-in-law. He's trying to get into music, and he's like, "Can you look out for my son-in-law?" So I've been. So it's and you just, said no. No, no. <laughs> I, he's been to the Combat Jack Show studio, yeah. and it's just that whole concept of paying it forward, no. and, then, and then paying it back. I yeah. totally, totally subscribe yeah. to that. And also, like, how about just the the sort of serendipity of you running into your dude and his girls there, and like all this sort of comes together. I totally believe in the power of determination, man. Like, yeah. like if you are determined to do something, like. Shit just con- the universe conspires on, on your behalf to make that shit happen because yeah. I've I've witnessed it time and time and time again. Here's something we really want you to re- retell because okay. you told us this. I think it's early <sighs> in your in your law career. Yeah, can you tell the story about the sauna? 
Diddy. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Diddy's ice cold, man. Like Diddy's the best that ever did it. I think for my generation, Diddy's the best that ever did it. Yeah. Uh, for so many different uh, for so many different reasons, but I remember my partner in the time, my partner at the time, Ed Woods. We kept trying to have a meeting with Puff. Now we knew Puff's attorney. We knew that we didn't have a shot at representing Puff. But we just wanted to get in that circle. And here's this young black guy. Here's these young black attorneys. We're in the same clubs. He sees us. We see him. We're at the same parties. It's like, yo, Puff, just throw us one of your clients, man. Can we get Big? Can we get Craig Mack? Can we get Mace? We wanted to be in that universe. So we had been chasing Puff down for like about six months. And finally, he's like, all right, fuck it. Meet me at the... Um, the the Temp Street bathhouse. You guys familiar with the bathhouse? No. no. It's it's this old. It's this Turkish bathhouse. It's like the Sky Barn in uh, <laughs> Syracuse. In no, no, it's not like the Sky Barn. It's this old. <laughs> it looks like a dungeon, and it's got these old uh, Hasidics mm-hmm. in there. Mm-hmm. And then, but it, at the time, it was really cool because Russell would hang out there, and Andre Harrell, you know, Hans Puff, and sure. LL Cool J, and John Amos, and it was just like this. And actually, the late. Uh, 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 JFK Jr. Like okay. it was just this real cool place, and it's still uh, one of the few remaining gems in New York City. I, you know, it's still there. It's still there, and 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 it's great massages, great fitzes. It's, it's just it's, it's <laughs> ill. It's ill, and it's still relatively affordable. And, oh, okay, yeah. So yeah. anyone can go there. Anyone can go there. Okay. You can just get up there and go there, and and you know, I think it's like forty dollars for for general access and then a different pay schedule for a, a fee for a massage but it's still there yeah, yeah, by yeah. the way this uh this podcast is now sponsored by <laughs> temp street <laughs> turkish <laughs> bathhouse so anyway so we're in there like we go in there me and my my, my former partner and so there's this one big ass room called the radiant room mm. and it's it's like the biggest room in there it's like the main attraction and these fucking guys are in there whipping other people with like uh with, with, with grape leaves or some shit like that. It's it's just sure. You know, it's just crazy. Yeah. You were but it's, not high on mescaline. This is no, like, yeah. it, it was all this sweated is like a out. Baca now. But it's so fucking hot in there. So Puff decides he wants us to meet him in the hottest fucking room. <laughs> and he, you know, Puff. When you when you're talking to Puff, he mumbles, and you can't hear him. So it's this steam <laughs> going on. It's fucking torture. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. So we're leaning into him. <laughs> And the shit was torturous. And me and Ed were like, yo, whatever we do, don't run out. Whatever you do, show Puff you could stand Stick it out. heat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yo, five minutes in, I run out. <laughs> it's too fucking hot. I run in, Ed Woods is running out, and, and, and fucking Puff is cool as a fan. And I think he was really fucking with us, but we wrote it through. And then that really really began the, 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 the beginning of a, a great relationship. Man. So, so from there, you link up with the Hitmen? The Hitmen. Well, we had had uh, uh, Derek Angeletti and Ron Lawrence, but then we get Nasheem Merrick and... You know, Harf Pierre, which is Puff's right hand man for forever, and Puff referred st- a young Stevie J to us, and Mario Winans, and yeah. just that whole. You got the whole roster. We had the whole roster. Yeah. Uh, which was an amazing, amazing run. Just like, you know, being in the studio and watching Big perform, mm-hmm. you know, um, record uh, Hypnotize. Ugh. You know, just did being, you know Biggie from, uh, from Brooklyn at all? I didn't no? know Biggie at all from Brooklyn. I knew Biggie from from puff Mm -hmm. and you know i was one of those we were one of those early cats that received like the like the early 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 pre like album cassette of ready to die and we were like oh shit like it's you should leak that yeah (laughs) well how how do you well man dub it or something yeah yeah, yeah. wait wait. how do you get into entertainment law in the first place like why are you doing that and you're not doing like serendipity okay it's all serendipitous so my cousin Whose check I saw, yeah, yeah, who yeah. worked at the Park Avenue firm while I was in law school, he became the general manager for Andre Harrell's oh, fledgling uptown? uptown. Dope. And so I didn't know what that meant. I didn't think the music industry was real. You know, you saw Russell Simmons from afar building this Def Jam empire, but <clears throat> I didn't know what the fuck uptown was. So I was like, yeah, whatever. You, you're starting <laughs> a label. Cool. So I remember. Being in school in, 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 in at Georgetown and watching some video show and watching I'll Be Sure yeah. uh, performing his video uh, day and night on the city rooftops. And I was like, 
that's Uptown Records. Oh, shit, that's real. So one thing I have a great knack for being is I can be a fucking pest. I can stalk the <laughs> well, shit out of you. Well, you and Diddy. Me and Diddy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I started pesting, pestering the shit out of my cousin. Like, dude, get me in. Do get me in. Do get me in. Do, me, do get me in. Yeah. And, like, the dude was ducking me. He was not returning my calls. But uh, the summer that I graduated from law school, one day he called me. He was like, yo, I think there's an opening for uh, an intern in the legal department at Def Jam. And I was like, fuck. And then that changed my whole fucking life, man. Amazing. Um, so we had Clark Kent on the podcast. Yes. Um, Super DJ Clark Kent. Yes. yes. The, just Who the gave like, some crazy stories. Mm-hmm. But I looked online after the episode came out, and I was like thinking, like, oh, nobody's ever told these stories before. And then I saw that you had told a bunch of the stories. Okay. <laughs> on well, we Complex. Were, yeah. yeah. Um, so, like... You know, you were around for the Shine story. Yes. When? I made the Shine story happen. You did. I made... Well, I was, when he got signed. Well, right, right. Because there was a second story that Clark told about uh, the mixtape being thrown out the window. I don't remember that one. It's when uh, he... Clark played, introduced... Yeah, he played um, uh, Shine's music. Or, yeah, yeah, his demo for Jay. Right. And Shine left, and they started driving off. And he took this. Jay took the CD and chucked it out the window. Really? Yeah. yeah. And apparently, like, he was rhyming over all of Jay Z instrumentals. Well, it's kind of ill because Clark referred Shine to me, and I remember being in the office one day, like early in the morning, and fucking Shine calls, and he's like, "No, no, I was referred to you by Clark," and he starts rhyming. So what's weird is, initially, he had the same cadence as Jay Z. Yeah, but a he young- sounded like Biggie. He didn't sound like Biggie yet. He to me the my my first listening to, to Shine, yeah. he sounded like Jay. Crazy. And then the next time I heard him he sounded like Big. So I was like, You're like this fucking <laughs> Cypher. Chameleon. Chameleon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you get a lot of referrals like I, I soon after you started? Were people like hungry and looking like just for any we end? We got we got a lot of referrals and I think that that's based on the fact that we were of like So coming into the music industry in in nineteen eighty nine as a young attorney, like Harry Allen dubbed me like ground zero, like the <laughs> hip hop attorney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was I grew up in that culture. And yeah. I knew the culture. So being around all these creatives who were like, he gets the music, he's in the clubs, he's yeah. in the studios. Let's He's on mescaline, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no, the mescaline <laughs> thing, man, that was before, man. Don't don't do that. <laughs> don't do that, man. But, you know, they just felt comfortable. And we spoke the same language. And we were learning all this legalese and what the deals were at the same time. So it was kind of like a coming of age for that class. Yeah. That mm-hmm. hip-hop class of, right. like, 90. So Damon, oh, yeah. like, Clark introduced, bought us Damon, who, you know, had been my client bef- way before he started running with Jay-Z. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And Ski Beats and, and once again, Ron Lawrence and, 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 and Derek Angeletti, Two Kings and a Cypher. I did that. That was yeah. like my first rap deal. So like seeing this the, this emerging business yeah. and being around all these people that would eventually become something in the, in the, in the, in the industry was crazy, man. Um, a special time. And you would run into everyone like late anyway. at night at the club? like Dude, I remember running into Tupac on broadway like you it was just you'd see you not it's, it didn't even have to be at night yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. you know we, we our office was he was, in cats <laughs> no he was not in cats he was with the late stretch and they were just running around yeah eating hot dog you know from the from the from the from the carts and you would just it was you'd see everyone yeah and the hottest place though i guess ground zero was like the hottest place was in front of the universal building mm-hmm, where, mm-hmm. which was at the time i think uh, uh uptown and Puff was always out there. And Puff always had Puff always had that energy. <laughs> he even before he popped, he always had that energy. So you'd always want to see what was going on in front of the Universal Building. Yeah, yeah. With Universal Building on like fifty seven, what on on yeah on fifty seventh and, and Broadway. See, it's always weird to me that like clubs used to like, exist in Midtown. Like that Midtown used to be cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, Midtown was cool, but. Downtown was always the coolest. Yeah, like, sure. Downtown was really But like, like Studio 54 was... But Studio 54 wasn't Not that it was like a cool, cool place. It wasn't But cool. it was just that... It was established. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was Times Square of today. Yes. You know, <laughs> but downtown was always the cool spots, man. Yeah. Well, but you became the guy. We became, the, yeah, at the or time. Or the guy. Well, we like, were the guys because we were actually challenging the power structure at the time. You yeah. Know? You know, the state uh, Jewish firms that, 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 that had... 
you know, a, a, a chokehold on the industry. And all of a sudden, who these young black hip hop kids yeah. who had the credentials yep. mm-hmm. and had the clients. So, right. I mean, I, I, I told this story years ago about how um, I got into a, a shouting match with Lior mm-hmm. um, over Clark Kent. And he said some crazy shit like, you don't know who I am. I could fucking erase you from this business like go fuck yourself yeah you know it was just a uh, uh, just a gut reaction and after i hung up i was like fuck yeah i fucked up my career because leor you know you don't fuck with leor right mm-hmm. and then a couple months later we happened to pick up this new mc by the name of dmx yeah. and leor is calling us like dude i, I made a mistake <laughs> can we come and sit down and break bread and it, 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 it's crazy man Man. Just the just the leverage that we had without even knowing yeah. that we had that leverage. Well, all these rappers, um, we'll talk about like they'll brag about having um, Jewish lawyers. Yes. Does that ever bother you being a Haitian American? Um, you know, some initially it did, yeah. and then it became cliche. But sometimes I'd hear that, and I'd be like, "Yo, dude, like we we're commanding a good uh, percentage of these deals out in New York. See what the fuck are you guys talking about?" Yeah. But I mean, did you ever consider switching to Judaism? No, because I was a, I was. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a happy Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to like the college thing, when yeah. you switched up and you're like, you know, the arts, I'm going to put that off yeah. and I'm going to get into like this whole other. And this is, where the, this, the, this is where the discipline comes in again. Yeah. This is where the discipline comes in about this shit is impossible. This shit is crazy, but I could hunker down and just. But just, do you get that? Do you get that creative release from being in the music industry now and being around? The J's and the Ski Beats and the DMX's and all that. I thought I was. Even at the time, though? I thought I was, but... Until you weren't. I was still miserable. Right. Because, um, you know, developing what is the, the legal is the right side. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Developing that, I remember just my, my brain and my thought patterns shifting in yeah. law school. And I just never loved the whole delving into contracts. I never loved the whole negotiations because to me it was just you know unless you had certain attorneys where you had kind of like uh, uh rhythm with mm-hmm. i just hated that combative i hated like the whole reptilian aspect of right. like i'm gonna fuck you over right or you're gonna fuck me over right and then as the stakes got higher as our clients became people that commanded amazing deals i just hated that pressure yeah and one of the you know i lost jay-z Early on in his career, actually, we had been running around with Jay Z for about four or five years, knocking on every door. I remember when the Leor said no. I remember when everyone in the industry said no. We did the reasonable doubt deal with penalty. He popped, and I lost him as a client. So that killed mm. my fucking uh, confidence. Yeah, it killed my confidence. So I got real nervous with developing clients four mm. or five years into the game, and when they popped. I was like, oh shit, are they still my client? Like, I developed that kind of like, I don't know, it was, it was just fucked up. My yeah. confidence was fucked up and I wasn't happy. Yeah. Like, I was making money. I was doing these great deals. And, and it, at the time, you, it was easy to get a deal. Like, I, I, like, we did deals with bum rappers every fucking day. Right. 20, 30,000 coming in like every other week, every other month. Yeah. But it was like, I just got tired of that shit. And I, and I, and I felt that. At any given point, I would be exposed for being a fraud. That's how. But isn't that how everybody feels about everything? Um, I feel like everybody has that feeling of like being exposed. You know, it's so the cra- fear of being exposed. It's so crazy because what I do right now, I think it, it really just comes so natural to mm-hmm, me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not about the hype, but I feel I'm, I don't think I'm the best interviewer at all. But I feel what I do. I'm the best at what I do. And I can really say that without the hype, with confidence. Yeah. And the, I'm, my interviews are so honest yep. that how, how can I be a fraud? Well, 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 first of all, our interviews are so good. Yeah, you, yeah, you guys are so fucking hot. <laughs> yo, yo, but before, before we pivot to that, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, can you give us one good DMX story? Um, can you give us 12 good DMX stories? <laughs> <sighs> I mean, DMX... I mean, DMX would knock Def Jam execs out. Like he was, he was unstable, you know. <laughs> but, but then you'd sit with DMX, and he would just philosophize about shit. And I'm like, this dude is like fucking, like he's he's blessed. Like he he had this incredible energy. I don't have a specific yeah. DMX story. It's just like once he got on a roll talking, like he he you could tell that he. 
you know, there, there was talks back then that he wanted to become a reverend or a preacher. Hmm. Yeah. He had that. He had that charisma. Like DMX, DMX, if you can remember or imagine, DMX was so hot that he was the only artist that Jay Z stayed out of his. Like he yeah. always get. He made sure to kiss DMX's ring because right. DMX was that red hot until well, so he was president, crazy. and then he was able yeah. to ax him. So. Yeah, but that, but, yeah. but 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 he was president, and <laughs> no, at yeah, that yeah. time DMX was on the decline as You're well. Right. So yeah. you knew D and Wah back then. <laughs> um, yes. And and what were they like? Like sort of early Rough Riders. Um, just era. don't fuck with them. Like they they were very serious about their business. They had this, um kind of like militant black Muslim type of, um, I guess, sheen to them. Mm-hmm. But they were about their business. Yeah. You know, they were about their business. And they just came in from nowhere. Just like the Rough Riders, we're going to change this whole shiny shoot, yeah. shiny shiny suit sensibility. Yeah. And here comes fucking X with bad tattoos and the fucking dog chain, <laughs> followed by Eve. And, and it was just it was just a whole... Did you wear shiny suits? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> Where'd you get them from? Um, <laughs> 57th Street. Like, there were all these men. I'm telling you, 57th Street's popping. 57th Street's popping. Street poppin'. poppin'. <laughs> all these gaudy men's Yo. suit shops <laughs> where mm-hmm. you go in. This is crazy, man. Um, With the I big to, shoulders. And- I used to wear um, uh, my bar mitzvah jacket inside out. <laughs> really? Oh. It had the satin inside. Cri- was it crisscross? Oh. Yo, you, yeah, something yeah. like that. Criss- crisscross yeah. era? Or? It was lit. It was lit. Yo, it was lit. Yo. So, um, wait, I want to... Can you tell uh, Theta's story? I barely remember it. I uh, do you remember Theta Sandiford? She used to work at Def Jam and like the, on the digital I side. I remember her name. She. I remember her and I remember her name, but I don't remember. Yeah, she took us out one time and she was like, "Oh man, I have a crazy DMX story." She, uh, DMX was doing a music video and he wasn't showing up, right? And so like hours go by, and uh, at a certain point. Lior has to go up to his house in Yonkers to go get him. Yeah. And I don't remember the specifics, but I do remember that that Lior had to contend with uh DMX's dogs mm-hmm. to the point that DMX's dogs ended up going to the video shoot with DMX right. and Lior. <laughs> yeah. I think I I I've heard, I remember hearing something like that. Um Okay, look. DMX was really attached to his dogs. Yo, right? apparently. I mean, yeah. he needed them at the one, shoot. One love boomer. And by, <laughs> right? Then there's no one like him, by the way. No, like, no one like him. That's, I think that's what's I, amazing I about I interviewed him, him once, um, and I I started talking to him about, like, um, he used to drive through Harrison in Westchester, which is our town, and he would get pulled over, and uh, he would then have to go to the court, which is where everybody in my high school would, like, you know, ditch class and go right. see DMX in court. Really? Yeah, yeah. 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 That was, like, a, like the Look, like I past mean, time, like, yeah, yeah. let's go see DMX It's like, yo, you know he's going to get pulled every, over every, every like, couple weeks. Just, <laughs> it's like, he's yeah. driving without a license, like, it's bound to happen. Yo, like, DMX was, was, was one of the greatest, man. Yeah. yeah. You know? So, okay, everyone knows, I, I think at this point... Uh, your switch over to podcasting yep. and and the road that you have traveled and and how um, really legendary in podcasting you have made things you right. Think so I do, okay. I do. I Thank think you. you've really made your mark. Thank I you. think longevity, consistency, level of guests, and the conversations. I think Thank all you, those man. things together yeah. are pretty pretty epic. I want to know what it's like to have. Damon Dash to have Wah come back. They see you now and they're just like, oh my God, it's Reggie, but it's Combat Jack. Right. What's that like after all these years to have him come back in your life and have a conversation? It's like a reunion, man. It's definitely like a reunion. You know, uh, particularly with, with, with Damon Dash, like we've, uh, like our relationship has been hot and cold. Um, but, you know, knowing Damon um, and seeing that look in his face, like, yeah, I, I'm proud of what you're doing. That's great. You know, and, and, and knowing full well, knowing Damon, knowing to get out of his way, mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to going, because I don't think anyone could go head on with Damon. Yeah. I'd love to hear an argument between Damon and Star. <laughs> like, that's what I want to hear. I would pay good money to see both right, of them right. argue over a point. But, like, you get out of their way. And then, you know, just it's, it's kind of respectful. Um, there's a, I think what I do is um, there's a recognition um, and it's really just, it's a, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's a reunion. It's like a conversation. It's not an interview. Yeah. We're going over memories. I mean, I do have my questions, but it's, so it's, 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 it's kind of like a cheat code, man. It, it really, how is do you prep code. for an interview? Um, I prep like yeah. crazy. Um, so, so I just interviewed Norman Lear. 
Yep. And the last thing that he wrote was a 700 page autobiography. Wow. And so I read it. I, I, I read the whole thing from cover to cover. And mm-hmm. then I started looking for interviews. And Well, how long before the, um, before actually interviewing him, did you line it up? That was uh, lined up a couple of months ago, so I was able. But I procrastinated until the week before and then read mm-hmm. it. So, like, I read everything yeah. that I can, particularly if if it's their memoirs. You know, uh, Dow Strawberry came through. I yeah. read the book. Luke came. I read. You know, yeah. and I think yeah. this 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 discipline comes once again from law school. And sure. then I just I just look at every angle. I look at other interviews. I try to see. I don't try to go over the same questions, but I kind of try to go into the spaces where those questions were left yeah right. if you can understand sure yeah. it's, it's like preparing for battle in a sense yeah, like, yeah. And, and i kind of want to bring old points you know go into new points and so it's i just i just really i sequester myself i'm like i tell my wife i don't want to be fucked with yeah you know, i don't want you tell my team yeah like don't call me during the day that i'm, I'm preparing and i just really immerse myself in that world how did dallas penn used to uh prepare for an interview um, Dallas was brilliant, so I don't think Dallas ever prepared. <laughs> Dallas, Dallas was just, you know, he was just... How did you guys connect? Dallas, um, okay, so I loved Dallas's blog. Yeah. Mm-hmm. During the great uh, hip-hop renaissance, blog renaissance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of what, 05, 06? Yep, yeah. So I was a fan of Dallas Penn's, and Dallas Penn was a fan of my blog at the time. Mm-hmm. But, you know... No one knew how I looked, but I knew how Dallas looked. So I remember being... Well, Dallas has quite a look. Yeah, and he was really you know, open with putting his, his, his images up on his blog yeah, at the yeah. time. So I remember being at a party, and I was clean. It was my wife and I. It was a, a friend of ours, Rachel Goldstein. It was her birthday. And so in the back was the VIP. So we were walking in the back, but in the front it was just like the regular cats. It was the... Uh, Fuck, I forget the bar at the time. They just closed it recently. Anyway, so I'm clean. I come in with my wife, and I see Dallas at the bar. And I'm like, I know who you are. And he's like, well, who the fuck are you? And I'm like, excuse me, and I just go into VIP. Yo. Come back. He's still out there. I'm like, dude, I know who the fuck you are. He's like, so he just gives me this weird look. And I keep like fucking with him, keep going into the VIP where he has no access. And I think maybe the third or fourth time, I was like, yo. Dallas Penn Combat Jack. And he was like, oh, shit. Let me get the digits, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So we exchange um, numbers. And I think it's the very next week, the motherfucker calls me at midnight. And in my, in my, he wakes up the whole fucking household. Yeah. I'm like, yo, I'm going to have to curve this guy because this guy is weird. Right. But we just start building and building. And if it weren't for Dallas Penn, I wouldn't have the Combat Jack show. Because uh, A King, our producer, yep. was a programming director at PNC, PNC, mm-hmm. yep. now defunct PNC Radio, okay. online radio station, yep. and he approached Dallas Penn to do an online radio show. Dallas was like, "Yo, Reg, do you want to do this radio show?" I was like, uh, "We I sat on the fences for a while, and finally, I was like, fuck it, let's do it. Let's do the Dallas Penn." combat jack show he's like no it's going to be the combat jack show and he pushed me in front of him and then it became the combat jack show man so if it weren't for dallas penn i wouldn't be doing this why has dallas not rocked with the show the entire time dallas has to do his own thing okay um dallas is is unbridled genius did you understand that he had to do his own thing the entire time i always knew and but i just never knew when Mm-hmm. He was, and you know Dallas. I, I was, my history with Dallas is Dallas has quit the show like three, four times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and always left me kind of like, "Fuck, you can't do this to me." You yeah, know? and the last time he did it, I was like, "I'm good." Like I really got to the point where it's like, "I'm good." Like I had prepared myself, I had gotten the confidence and the legs and the track record was like, "I'm good." Yeah, mm-hmm. but Dallas is 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 you know one of the sharpest um, minds that I've ever met, and then his knowledge of. New York City. Yeah. His knowledge of, of black history. His mm-hmm. knowledge of things like his knowledge of architecture. Mm-hmm. Like he's like he's a smart his knowledge of breaking into cars 
you know, his knowledge of, you know, polos and st- this By the way, is- that's the best, like, run of things that he knows. <laughs> and then just, like, I love that you throw him breaking in cars, like, just in there. Because he used to break in the cars. Yeah, 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 I mean, sure. he was a professional. Like, I don't want to say professional. But he used to. <laughs> he was a professional car thief, you know. Yeah, but yeah. Dallas is amazing. Like, yeah. he's just all these worlds that you shouldn't be an expert at. He, he He's that. You know, I love Dallas Penn, man. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and the I many, saw him the other night. Yeah. yeah. The many iterations uh, the Combat Jack show has gone through, you've ended up <laughs> – now you're on a pretty good streak with you and Premium Pete. Yes. Um, you and Pete didn't always get along. No. Um, can you talk about that? We're going through something right now. Okay. I mean, you know, because Pete wasn't supposed to be on the show. <laughs> right. And Pete forced his way onto the, sh- onto the show, and I fought that for so many years. And then – once Dallas officially left, it was like, it's me and you, Pete, and we just rocked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the past year and a half, it's been Pete and I. Yeah. I'm surprised that you say that that he, um, I don't know if, if wasn't welcome would be like the right way to describe it. But well, like, the thing was. It, but yours always felt like basically like anybody who's in the room has a microphone. Well, th- no, no. I think For that's what everyone felt. Right, yeah. Everyone in the room felt they had access to the microphone. Yeah. But what I had, what I had sketched out was it was Dallas, myself, and A King, and whatever guests we had. Initially, mm-hmm. we didn't have guests, so yeah, you know, as we as we opened up the format to having guests, it was it was us three, NY Delight at the time, who sure. was one of our co-hosts, yeah, mm-hmm. um, and that was it. And, and then, then, but then DJ you had Ben Hamin. Like, ben right? Hamin, Ben Hamin asked me one day, he's like, "Can I DJ on your show?" I was like, "Sure." And I'm like, motherfucker, stay on the fucking turntables. Get off the mic. Yeah. And then you, you had know? Matt Raz. Matt popping Raz, in who I actually pushed. I pushed Matt Raz because he was he was just so his his voice was just so in contrast yeah. to all the other voices that I thought that added. And then you know, Just Blaze was like, yo, yeah, dude, just can Blaze. I be on this show? I was yeah. like, what? Yo, you had and a whole Jean collection. Gray. Jean Gray. That was we went through this, this whole. Is like a, it's just like your own like. Just crew. Yeah. I mean, you guys it's are like, like a Simpsons episode. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, but but reference. but you know, I mean, I I think that's you know, I look forward to to, to finding my groove, and then I look fo- forward to changing that groove. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Know, consistently because you you know, I, I mean, the the times yeah, we know that too. Yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah. You guys yeah I mean, look, once once yeah, times do change, right. and like, and you're not going to stop because shit changes. No, we describe ourselves. No, we're going like, to stop because once something becomes popular, then we stop doing it. Yeah, we're yeah. like we're like we're like the Buddhists who like do they paint paint with sand and right. then blow it away because it's all about the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's who we are. That's you who know? you guys yeah, are. You know? It's too um, hot right now. Let's, yeah. let's move. <laughs> I yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, basically every single time that we've done like anything that's become popular. Yeah. Like the sketches. The why? Why is that? Um, I think I think that, it's a fear of success. I don't know. Really? It's no. no what no, is it? No. Uh, honestly, I think it's just to stay ahead of the curve. Right. Um, that's 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 hard to do. It is. Man. And yeah. by the way, we never wanted to do like sketches forever. And the cool thing now is like if we get stopped on the street or people see us in an elevator or a train or something like that, and they're just like, "Yo." I think your sketches were the best thing you ever did. Or other people were like, the MTV interviews, yeah. those are the best things you ever did. Or people were like, yo, your music, that's the best thing you ever did. Like, do more of that, that, right, or right, that. Right, right, right. And like, that's cool for us. Like, yeah. that different people can like different things. And but, like, but you guys haven't stopped, though. Like, no. You guys continue no. to move. And that's, that's the most important thing. Yeah, you guys well, have to continue. You have to continue moving. Also, see, we're a lot alike in that we're very persistent, we're very focused and determined. And like, we could never stop. We could never stop moving forward. Right, because right. like, if we did, like, we're done. We're done. You know? And we still got to go down to, like, see our relatives at Thanksgiving, yeah, yeah, you know? And, yeah. like, have some sort of answer as right, to what right. we're doing. Yeah, what are you guys doing? You're you're so successful in all these iterations. You've had so many amazing guests. The Ice-T episode was legendary. I, was, yeah. Um, your Just Blaze and <gasps> Damon Dash confrontation was oh just my God. unforgettable. Oh, my God. Your, Kevin Gates 1 and 2. Yo. Kevin, did you like part 2? I haven't listened yet. It's, you know, I like Kevin Gates. Yeah. And, he just, and got, just got married. He yeah. just got married. And... There's something hypnotizing about the dude. Like he's, he, you know, he just pulls me into his world. Yeah, and I just really, I, 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 I want to figure him out. Like, and and he allows me that room to try to figure him out. So it's kind of like this weird dance that Kevin and I have that I that I'm really grateful to have because I didn't know who the fuck Kevin Gates was a year ago. You who booked him on your thing. Um, the label. They were like, this is one of those rare instances where the label was like, they were right. <laughs> can you do a favor for us? And I was like, eh, yeah, fuck it. Wow. Do this. So I was kind of like, just like I prepared like, probably like the least I ever prepared for an interview. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wait a minute, this dude. Is fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah. And that, you know, that, you know, became, it wasn't supposed to be an episode on its own. I yeah. Was like, we went oh. and it became an episode on its own. Um, do you like his music? I like his music. 
I do like his music. Okay. I mean, I, I, I very I, much like his music. Yeah. yeah. I, I, he, the, he, he's charismatic. Mm-hmm. Um, he, Isn't he, it funny, by the way, for people who don't think that like showing your personality and going on shows like this or doing funny sketches or whatever, what have you, that that helps you uh, sell yourself is well but you're talking i mean because it depends on yeah who you there, are. there's a lot of people who are afraid of it because they don't have that no i yes. know but but for me as a consumer there's a lot of times where i'll watch an interview or like someone will sit here and i'll be like you know what i like you so much i want to like give you that second look right exactly yeah. but and not I, everybody gets that no that's not fair. everybody gets it and not everybody has it i mean yeah that's being right. so yeah. transparent is not for everybody right You've got a lot of people that are clamoring for the limelight and the microphone and and and, and this platform but who the fuck are they right like mm-hmm. other than you know wanting you know just being thirsty for the limelight who is the most surprising person to reach out because you've you know gotten to this level now who are like you know what i want to be on that on that on that show so this is true story um i always knew that i wanted ll on the show but i was like how do you get ll and then uh a year about a year ago had a vivid dream and i remember waking up and i said honey i'm gonna interview ll cool j right (laughs) i I just mescaline yeah yeah. (laughs) no 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 more mescaline say no to drugs man So, it's a rhyme. Mescaline is, you know. So I had been reaching out yeah. to his PR, and we were going back and forth. And then last year, we were at A3C. Yeah. And his 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 PR hit me and was like, "Yo, LL's in Atlanta. He wants you to interview him right now." <laughs> but you know, when you're at these these conferences and these festivals, there's so much shit going on. Right. Yeah. And I'm so focused on this and focused on that. I was like, "There's no." fucking way I can interview LL this weekend. No disrespect to LL, but this is LL. I yeah. got and so after three they were they were bugging me to interview LL and I was like at a certain point I was like respectfully like I can't do LL while we're down in Atlanta. And a couple of months later he was in town and but LL really wanted to be on the show and That's I was great. like, yo like that's really great. Yeah. Does he listen to your podcast? Do you know? Um, I think he had, you know, the Chuck He's D, aware of it. The Chuck D episode yeah. really yeah. broke ground for 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 that generation of legends yeah. because it was like, oh shit, it's this other shit going on right. without and Chuck's talking cuz Chuck is hard to 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 to, to have access to. Sure. Mm. No, but and I think what's really cool <coughs> is that you've not only you can get the Kevin Gates right. and you can get the Chuck D's. Yeah. Like you're yeah. not just doing like no one, no one can pin you in one corner, dude. Um, I mean, Norman had, Lear is the better. Norman Lear, Norman Lear, yeah. the, uh, the hip hop cop, hip hop um, cop, Corey Pegues. Um, you know, our next episode, well, it's going to be, but um, is is Lisa Evers? Oh, dope. Oh, cool. And and the reason why I wanted to, uh, you guys already recorded it, right? I we, saw a yeah, picture we, with we, you guys. We yeah. Recorded it. Um, so Lisa to me is an amazing story because we know her as this. Fox Five reporter, yep. and we know her as Street Soldiers, pioneer Street Soldiers. But you know, she did such a great job of kind of like having people forget her past as Lisa Sle- Sliwa, uh, wife of Curtis Sliwa, oh. co co yeah. co leaders of the the um the uh, Guardian Angels. Yeah, right. I had and no just idea. like that whole like if you go back, there's not much footage on her, but if you go back to if you look at Lisa Slee with this, her, she was wild, dude, like on the Morton Downey Man. Jr. show back yeah. in the 80s or running around with like a young wild Howard Stern. And like she really had this like zero tolerance for crime. She was really outspoken and really brutal with regard to the Central Park Five. And mm-hmm. just seeing her do this. So I had to get that story. Yeah. yeah. Had to get that story. Man, the Jessica Rosenblum <sighs> episode was fantastic. It changed my life. Like that, I'm, I'm, I swear to God, it changed my life. Why? Um, because um, I remember that was one of those periods where things were changing. I think I had just lost Dallas Penn from the show, and I was mm-hmm. like, what's going on? Am I falling off? You know, there's always that voice, like, are you falling off? Sure. And so she came on the show, and I was going through this period where I was not getting the guests that I wanted. Mm-hmm. Like, I was, like, I, I was just like, not, I was like, my batting average sucked. Okay. And I was like, did I lose it? You know, and so we had Russell on and he had mentioned how 
Jessica had opened up the doors for him in the downtown scene. I was like, well, let's get Jessica. I was like, eh, you know, sometimes you have those guests. I don't know if I'm one of those guests. I was like, yeah, we'll, se- we'll settle for you. Nah. Mm-hmm. So she was a settled guest, I think, at the time. And then just she was so brilliant. And she, re- she, she told me, I, I asked her, what did she credit her success to? And she said that, you know, Chris Lighty mm-hmm. used to always tell her, whatever's going on around you, stay in your lane and master your lane. And I was like, this is so, it, it, it's so important that I hear this right now because shit is changing. And I'm looking at other, I, I was at the time, I was looking at everybody else's lane and mm-hmm. like, trying to figure out what am I, what am I going to do? Is this post-complex? <coughs> post-complex, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I think, you know, I think the reason why I was also in this state is because coming off that high of the complex show, it was like, I got to find another one. Yeah, I got to right. find this. Yeah. I got to find that. I got to do a live show. I got to. So I was looking at what everybody else was doing and not what I was doing. And right. she, it really stuck with me. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to turn down all the noise, tune everything out, and just stay in my silo. Dope. And then last year ended up being a, a, an amazing year for us. Well, let's talk about this real quick. Yeah. You started a podcast network. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like, I mean, talk about like just levels. Um. So I really credit all of that to my partner, Chris Morrow. Mm-hmm. So when... Uh, things were kind of going shaky with PNC when I was an online radio show. Um, Twitter's amazing because I would just talk to Twitter and people would answer. And so Chris Morrow, amazing guy. So Chris is like the ghost writer, not the ghost writer, but he's the right. He's a he's a, a, a several times a New York Times bestseller list mm-hmm. for all the books he's written with Russell. He's got another book coming out on uh, uh, be- becoming a vegetarian. Mm. Um, so he, he, he's got that angle covered. Um, but he's also the producer for the, the syndicated arm of the Breakfast Club. Right. So mm-hmm. he knows radio. Right. But he, he's been a student of the podcast game. His whole thing when, when we met was like, online radio shit is cool, but podcast is where it's at. So yeah. when I left PNC, he used to um, – shit, I don't know if I could talk about this. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So I had access to – a very important person's studio. Yeah. And and we just converted the show into podcasts. So as we were building our relationship, he was like, let's build a network. And we had tried other shows, Sneaker Fiends, um, the show with Jazz Fly, uh, uh, Reality Check. And then we discovered, um, I don't want to say we discovered, but we we came across Kid Fury. Right, right, right. And And I thought, and and, and then Crystals. And I thought it was really cool because at the time, because we played a pause game, you know, we're getting a lot of flack for being like quasi homophobic and the whole nine was, I was like, yo, let's find someone that that, that, that will throw that off so that we're not stuck in that, you know, that. That's like odd future. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then we didn't know this guy would become the flagship show. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you connect with, with tax um tax i think was both a kid fury and a charlemagne call okay they saw his heat and his on twitter on twitter and they were like that dude yeah so you you hadn't met him i hadn't met him or had you heard like what he sounds like no but so good i'll tell you um we're really fortunate man because we got a we it's a really organic very loose relationship but charlemagne has been really instrumental in helping us, you know, uh, find talent. So mm-hmm. he's the one that was like, you got to fuck with tax. Yeah. And then Kid Fury was like, Kid Fury was like, you got to fuck with tax. And we were like, we got to fuck with tax. And that was a gamble because like this motherfucker was like. <laughs> wild. Wild. <laughs> wild. <laughs> but, you know, I, I can tell you, my, I love that dude, man, yeah. because mm-hmm. he's so genuine. Yeah. Um, he's new to the game. He's only been yeah. in, in 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 this in this in this blog game. I mean, in this podcast game since February. So going from February zero to sixty, he's now on uncommon sense. So he, you know, I've seen him struggle with how do I walk away from this street life and really embrace right, right. this new world? How do I not fuck this up? And which blows my mind, the women love him. Well, yeah, like, they do. He like like I was like. Tax, don't fuck around, my dude. <laughs> like I was like, honey, what is it about tax? She's like, nah, he's you know he's got it. Like yeah. he's the type of he's the bad boy that girls want to be with. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's become this like you know this this sex symbol. His like, Memphis Bleak episode yes. was his, great. His Styles episode, yes. like yes. just like solid. You're getting a different point of view, and and you know so you know um, 
our advertisers are blown away with tax because they're like, he needs to go into history books for bringing the medium, the podcast medium to the streets, to, place, to really yeah. the streets. Like the Combat Jack show is kind of highbrow right. to like some of his audience. And to me, that's just amazing. Yeah. Would you would you be open to and is it, is it a possibility for you to get Papoose on? I have reached out to Papoose because for the people who don't know, several times some they're butting up heads. Okay, so this was a learning experience. Like I guess early on in in my podcast career, um, I let loose mm-hmm. on 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 Papoose, um, and it was one of those rare instances where you're not expecting that to go viral. It mm-hmm. went super viral yeah. to the point where it was like. I got some calls from some very serious people like, yo, just lay low. Yeah. And I was like, I don't like that. You know, and, you know, at the time I thought it was genius what I was saying, but I really discovered really the the responsibility we have Mm -hmm. when you have a platform and when you have a voice because you you can say some really hurtful things Mm -hmm. that could really just disrupt not only your safety, but the livelihood of somebody else. So, you know, morally, Mm -hmm. Like I look back and it's like I, it's fucked up and it's not coming from a perspective of like being f- afraid or I'm just owning up. It's fucked right. up that I went in on Papoose like that, mm-hmm. and so I've reached out to his people like n- not just you know for this to be like a, a hit episode or for the sensational aspect of it. It's like I want to talk to the dude. Sure. I want to mm. apologize to the dude, and I think it would be a great just getting to know who Papoose sure. is. Yeah, I think you it give would be him a that platform. Great interview yeah. but he it, it hasn't happened and and that's his right to it and that's his know? right yeah. too i yeah. mean like yeah i mean he, you know he doesn't take disrespect too lightly and i and i respect that but yeah. i still want to have a conversation with him face to face hopefully you know uh, you know in front of the microphone so that we could really just have a really great conversation man. sure does young reggio say growing up <laughs> growing up you know going to going to elementary school have any idea that that this is the life you're going to live. Um, a commentator, a uh, uh, conversationalist. No, no. But um, one of my aunts tells me, like, she really doesn't know what I do. She doesn't understand this podcast thing, but she sees. Join the club. She sees me <laughs> yeah. doing, like, these, you know, these public speaking engagements. And she, she's like, listen, when you were three, we would be on the, on the bus, on the, on, the, on, the, on the public bus. And whoever was sitting in our proximity, you would start interviewing them. And I always knew that you would do something interviewing people, and I don't have any recollection of. But this. how great is that, though? Yeah, and 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 I, I guess it kind of affirms, like you know, I don't want to sound too hokey, but I really like having different careers and having to push and fit and squeeze. Like this, it feels so great to be in a in a career that's pulling me mm-hmm. as opposed to pushing, and and it really makes me. I have this awareness that at this point in my life, I'm really doing my life's work. That's like awesome. I'm really doing something that that I don't complain about, something that I really love, something that I know inherently I'm the best at what I do. Yeah. And like I, I say that- Well, hum- present company excluded. You know? <laughs> I mean, no, I, but we don't do the same thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you know, we, we, no. Do, we do different things. But I, at what I do, I mean, I'm in my lane and I'm the happiest that I've ever been. That's great. So, you know, it lends credence to what she said about, you know, You'd always, you know, she knew she was, I was always going to do this because it's something, I believe if you do something as a child endlessly and you have a passion for it, that's what you were meant to do Mm -hmm. as an adult. Don't you see this as a natural extension of like being a lawyer though? Like, yeah, just like drawing information out of people? Drawing information, examining, Mm cross-examining, the research, the reading, you know, facts and fact checking and just trying to read body language and trying to pull out as much information as possible. Yeah. You know, um, so th- I do this, um, you know, I've been speaking now at, at colleges and mm-hmm. there's this one real life story I have of a friend of mine. Um, <coughs> pardon me, Cesar Chivetta. And Cesar um, trained to become a classical conductor. He, he wants, he wanted to, conduct orchestras classical orchestras Mm -hmm. Uh, so he gets out of school and he realizes that's not the easiest fucking job to find Mm -hmm. and so he sends resumes out with with dreams of 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 conducting in china russia all over south africa all over the world nothing 
So about a year or so after just struggling, he finds a job as a painter painting houses. Mm. So he's like, how far away can you be from being a conductor and painting houses? So he's depressed, but he never gives up. Eventually, he starts conducting. He conducts in China, Russia, South Africa. He, he had an opportunity to conduct in front of the late, great uh, Nelson Mandela. Wow. But the first performance he had, he gets up on the stage and he starts conduct, conducting and he realizes that his stroke is immensely stronger and a lot more powerful and adds more depth to his performance. Pause. And he realizes, pause, <laughs> what, what, stroke. Yeah. stroke. Yeah, 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 good yeah, pause. Yeah. Yeah. And he realizes it, that those muscles have been developed through all of those years painting. of painting houses. So I really believe there are no wasted moments, man. That's what it is. Yeah. Combat Jack, Red USA. Man, we really appreciate you, Thank you coming. You. Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate you coming with dinner. gifts. Yeah, yeah, you brought cookies, man. Come on, man. You gotta be internet. You guys gotta be gracious. Man. Where's your fucking humility? Where did who raised you? Come on, man. Let's Yo, bring some class to the game. Shout out to your parents. Right? No, thank you. you. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Where can people follow you on Twitter? Uh, at Combat underscore Jack. But you can find me at you know the Combat Jack Show on um, iTunes. Um, SoundCloud has been a great partner. Stitcher. Just look us up. Google me. Use your Googles, you bastards. <laughs> Find you. Combat Jack at Sky Barn up in Syracuse. Yo, yo. Sky <laughs> Barn high on Mescaline. Yeah. 57th Street Combat yeah. Jack. Yeah. Yeah. Internet's don't do that. <laughs> I did that so you wouldn't have to go through that. Yo. No, but it got you into college. <laughs> no, right? Got me to law school. Yo. Yeah. <laughs> Mescaline. <laughs> That's going got you into uh, I just hope I don't get my demon in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Reg. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone, for listening to this celebration of Reggie Osei. Jeff, if people want to find out more about who you and I are, we are It's The Real. If people want to find out more about this podcast, 163 some odd episodes of A Waste of Time with It's The Real, if people want to go get their tickets, and they should, right now to our live show at SOBs on January 10th in just a week and a half. Jeff, where can they go? You can always go to itsthereal.com, I-T-S-T-H-E-R-E-A-L, no apostrophes, no spaces. We are there all the time, all day, waiting for you to buy your tickets. Let's go. You can also find us on soundcloud.com slash a waste of time if you want to find all of our episodes old or new. They are there. You can also find them on iTunes. Search for A Waste of Time with It's The Real. We are also on Twitter at It's The Real, Facebook at It's The Real, Instagram at It's The Real. If you want to find us on Snapchat, we are It's It's The Real. If you want to find us on Twitch, we are It's The Real, It's The Real. You can also find our music, which is on all streaming services, including and especially Spotify. Search for Teddy Bear Fresh by It's The Real. Our single Sugar High featuring Currency and Smoke Dizza is over 520,000 plays. Keep listening to it over on Spotify. Let's keep those numbers going up. Jeff, this podcast is not going anywhere. You know that. I know that. Unless our loyal listeners out there spread the word. And you put up a graph the other day that you took from our numbers that showed we doubled up our numbers from 2015 to 2016 and again from 2016 to 2017 the goal jeff is to keep those numbers going guys spread the word we know it starts with us jeff who do you want to shout i want to shout out shale thacker from the dc area a tribe called chef on instagram who sent us cookies 48 of them up to our apartment the nicest most thoughtful gift so many cookies and I just want to say that I'm done with the cookies. I finished them. They were delicious. They were not poisoned. And I want to shout him out. Thank you so much for supporting us in 2017. Here he goes, 2018. Thank you so much. Jeff, I want to shout out A. King from the Combat Jack Show. A. King, who has been a longtime friend and supporter of this podcast in our career and one of the greatest dudes. Obviously, he's been going through a really rough period and handling it with grace. We saw him at the memorial service. We salute him. We respect everything that he has done over his whole career, but especially when times are tough, A. King has stood up through and through and is a genuine dude, and I just want to say shout out to you, A. King. We support you. Keep going. Keep your head up, and this year will be a better one. Jeff, as always, not for real, for real. Sure, sure. We'll see you guys next week. Brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr